Welcome, Ty and that guy. I'm Wes Chatham, and this is my good pal, Ty Frank. Dude, I, I, I really dig the sexy NPR host voice you're doing right I'm now. I'm trying to switch it up, you know? Yeah, it's I, nice. feel, I feel like uh, we need more a, a more female demographic, um, so I, uh, I'm trying to switch it up a little bit. Um, I, I see you did your hair. You got, you got a nice little spiky haircut there. Well, uh, that's, that's for the ladies. Well, I ran here, so... Um, uh yeah <laughs> spiky <laughs> they love the spiky hair <laughs> or dudes you know or dudes whatever yeah, we don't we don't discriminate here so uh which, what are we doing today ty uh here there be dragons which was uh written by your friend and mine georgia lee and uh directed by uh rob lieberman or bobby Liebs, as i like to call him mm -hmm. fun fact you know what fun fact i'm going to mention uh, who his wife used to be? Who his wife used to be? Mary Lou uh, Henner. Because that is a fun fact. <laughs> that is a fun fact that he was married to Mary Lou Henner, and Which, uh, and she that's has a pretty cool thing to uh, have in your history. And double fun fact is she has uh, one of those crazy memories that she can remember every single day of her life. So if you say if you throw out a date that she was alive, she can tell you exact detail what that day was like. Pretty pretty impressive. Um, did you see that 60 yeah. minute special with her on it? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I saw clips from it. I didn't watch the whole thing, but yeah, uh, she was actually at an event that my old boss, George Martin went to, and mm -hmm. the two of them talked some, and he said she was a pretty fascinating lady to talk to. Mm -hmm. Quick side note, the here, the be dragons is the title of the, uh, of the, the show we're doing today. And I was thinking of our top five and I was kind of thinking about dragon movies because I've been. <laughs> But I realized that you and I would just talk about one movie the whole There's time. There's only one dragon. There's only one dragon movie. What movie is that? Well, it's Dragon Slayer. Dragon Slayer. Ta yeah. Ty and I have spent, I mean, how much? How many hours do you think we've talked about Dragon Slayer before in the past? Okay. Sing it. <laughs> a lot. We've talked about Dragon Slayer a lot. But my favorite moment, so, and this, uh, this was me making sure that Jen doesn't hate me because, mm -hmm. you know, I want to make sure she doesn't hate me. I was at your house for your birthday party. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was when you were still living in like by Santa Monica. Yeah, and the party went late. You know, there was a keg of beer, there was a bunch of food. We were all hanging out in that, like you had that air, outside area. We we're all hanging out at there. Yeah, and then the night was starting to wrap up. It was getting pretty late. It was like right. after eleven, you know. Right. And a few people drifted inside, and it was like me and you and a, just a couple people, and everybody was saying goodbye. I was, I think, I was like getting ready to call for an Uber or something. And we started talking about Dragon Slayer. And you immediately went over to your TV, jumped on Amazon and ordered Dragon Slayer. And was like, we're watching it. We're watching it right now. <laughs> and I looked over out of the corner of my eye and I saw Jen giving you this look like, motherfucker, do not start a two hour movie at 1130 at night when the party is wrapped. And I was like, yeah, yeah, no, I'd love to watch it, but I got to go, dude. That was so that your wife wouldn't hate me. That was the reason I left. Because if your wife wasn't giving you that look, uh -huh. I'd have sat down and we would have fucking watched Dragon Slayer. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I can't tell you how many times, uh, and Clint uh, has been there for a few of these, where I'm not cool at all. This is what we do is we take a bottle of whiskey and we watch movie trailers till the sun comes up and we drink yep. and we be like, you remember that movie? And then we go, we put on the movie trailer and then sometimes we'll watch the movie, like watch certain scenes of the movie or do something like that. So that was definitely headed to be one of those nights, but you checked out before, uh, well, before. if it was just you, it would have been one of those nights. We would have sat down. We could have cracked open your whiskey or whatever, the leftover beer. Yeah. We could have watched Dragon Slayer, no problem. But I saw the look she was giving you, and I knew that like if if you and I did that, I was gonna share some of that wrath. And <laughs> I did not I did not know her well enough to to want her mad at me like that. No, nah, so, yeah. you, you missed, I had to punch out. You misread it. She she gives me uh complete freedom to watch movies all night long. Um <laughs> and I think this was before kids, right? Or no? Uh no, you had um you had your oldest boy at that point. Okay. All right. So we are on Ganymede. The Rossi is still looking for answers. And we get some flashbacks to kind of figure out what happened before the attack and with Dr. Strickland, Glenn and May. And one of the, the first bombshells that was dropped in this episode is when a Naomi, I think, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, this is the first time that she admitted that she lost a child. And that child was still yeah. out there. So at this point, she asked Fred that one day she's going to need him to look for somebody, for it, right? But we didn't know that was yeah. her child. Yeah. 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 And then Amos gets shot again. <laughs> Amos gets shot. The guy is just kind of a bullet magnet. Yeah. I really love that scene because they're, they're now 
breaking into a part of the station that's been shut down for years. And this is where all the, this is the forbidden place where they're doing all their experiments on children. And we learn in the flashback, they're doing the experiments on children. And they bust in on a, a group of the experimenters and they're eating pizza and, <laughs> uh, and they get in a shootout and Amos gets shot in the chest. But then they make a terrifying discovery and they start seeing these little bodies inside these like coffins um, with the protomolecule all over them. And I remember at the time, I was like, Jesus Christ, we're getting a little dark here in this. Yep. Um, I've read the books, but I, you know, my memory is like Dora off of uh, Finding Nemo. Like I, I don't, like I'm watching all this for like for the first time. And I'm like, God, yeah. man, this is a good show. I, I'm actually talking to people about the show. That as if like I, I'm like, hey, so this thing called, you know, I'm telling people and they're like, yeah, we, we've, we've seen it. Yeah, we, we've been there for, for from the beginning. W was that all in the books? Yeah. I mean, I know it was in the books, but did it play out in that exact way? I mean, very similar. Yeah, they they have been. So the the idea there and this is not as specific in the show as it is in the books. But the idea there is they've been experimenting with the hybrids, mm -hmm. you know, taking people, infecting them, trying to control the, the manner that the infection expresses and getting these hybrid super soldiers. But it, it keeps failing. That's why, like the one that attacked Bobby's team, you know, mm -hmm. um, that's why it blows up because mm -hmm. they have this like fail safe to, to blow them up if they if they start to go bad. What Strickland is doing is he's got this group of kids that don't have an immune system mm -hmm. like May and the other kids in her group. They, their immune systems don't work. Mm -hmm. And so he's using them for like the second generation of super soldiers because he thinks that the thing that's causing the, the hybrids to go bad is when their immune system is fighting with the infection. It causes the, the thing to fail. Mm -hmm. So he thinks if he can take these kids and infect them, he can control the infection much better and he can control the, the hybrids much better. So that's why he's he started experimenting on the kids now. Now, but does youth have something to do with it, or is it, or is it just because it's he, just that these kids have a specific kind of genetic immune system problem? So it doesn't have to be kid. If if no, if, if an no. adult, like if it was John Travolta and the boy of the bubble, you could use him. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's the idea to have John Travolta. That was the idea, but you couldn't get. Yeah, him. <laughs> but we couldn't get it. He's he's very busy, and uh, yeah. Now. <laughs> What would be interesting is if these kids, if they, if it was the, the Teen Wolf rules where they could control themselves turning into the protomolecule monsters when they wanted to, then it wouldn't have been such a bad thing. So if you have the protomolecule power inside of you, but only when you want it, you could turn into it like Michael J. Fox and Teen Wolf whenever you wanted to. Like if you're playing a basketball game, you just turn into a protomolecule monster and just, just school people and just, you know, and dunk on people. <laughs> So uh, that never gets super horny. <laughs> what, what did you say, Clint? What did you say? He said whenever you get super horny. Oh yeah, that's right. The only time it wasn't in control is when he got super horny, right? Yeah. Or or angry, you know. So then that would be weird, you know. Um, the Teen Wolf thing was funny because they they kind of turned being werewolf into being the Hulk. Yeah. We're like, don't make me angry. You won't like me when I'm angry because I'll turn into a werewolf. But he could control it. Yeah, he could control it. And, you know, what was interesting is that he went through that whole poor man's American werewolf in London transition in his bathroom. And it took forever. You know, the hairs came out and the nose got long and it was painful and it went through all that. But then, like, people would look the other way, like Superman, like, look the other way and turn back and he was a full wolf. So they yeah. kind of took the transition time out of it and it didn't look painful anymore. So who wouldn't want to do that? Like, you could just tap into your teen wolf and, and come out. <laughs> And by the way, where was the government during all? Like, they didn't want to run experiments. They didn't, like, local news weren't interested in a boy that could turn himself into a wolf and play basketball. Because the whole movie, they were, you know, the father and everything, they, wanted to, they were trying to keep everything secret. They didn't want anybody to know. But then he comes out and he's surfing on a, on a van and he's playing basketball and dunking on people, turning into a wolf in front of people and nobody wants to know about this or nobody wants to figure out what's, what's happening to him or experiments. Everybody was very chill about it. Yeah, yeah, everybody was very chill about it. So, uh, if you could have a super proto molecule power, um, like the Toxic Avenger when he fell into the, the toxic, yeah. you know, then I would think he was doing the kids a favor. I think it'd be something like Dr. Strippen would have been a hero as opposed to uh, an antagonist. But the reality is, is that he wasn't doing because they can't control it, right? Once they become a proto molecule. No, and actually, in the show, uh, we show that he's putting control mechanisms in them. So that he can he can control them. So here's the thing is, is there's a lot of failure on the way to the first success. And each of those failures is a dead kid because, you know, they find the one kid in the body bag mm -hmm. in the incinerator room. 
um, that's a failure. That was a mis- that was that one of the early attempts that didn't work, and now you've got a dead kid. So I mean, even the process of developing the technology is pretty horrifying. Mm-hmm. I mean, when you're when you're killing kids to develop your tech, probably not the good guy. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. You're right about that. So one of the, the the scenes that I loved in this episode, and you and I are are we've talked about it many times with how much we love horror movies. There's some horror scenes in here, and one in particular is after their shootout, and they're behind them. And I, and I love when the door opens and they throw a bomb, uh, hand grenade in there, and they go and they shut the thing, and the, and uh, Amos throws the hand grenade back. But then you hear this like like this roar and all this noise, and people go ah, and the gun shooting and. Firing, yeah. And then you see the smoke come from the the uh, the vent, and then get sucked out of the vent, kind of like a backdraft style. And yep. uh, and then when the Rossi crew goes down into the basement to explore what's happening, they see Amos sees this like upside down capsule that was a coffin, and he said, "Oh, something broke in here." And he goes, "Wait, no, something broke out." And it's like, "Oh yeah." And then you see the doctor <laughs> that has her throat slit. What was her name? Yeah. I don't remember. God, if only we had the guy that wrote this in here. Yeah, I know. But you know what? I'm, I'm uh, old and I, you know, I'm old and I drink a lot. So my name uh, is shit. But she was there and she's gurgling blood and she's holding yeah. her throat. And then I always think it's more terrifying to see the aftermath of a slaughter than the actual slaughter. Yep. So you go in and you see that and then she's there and she's trying to talk, but she could barely talk. And Holden is in his uh, monster hunting phase and like he doesn't have sympathy. He pulls her medical supplies away and he's like, what happened here and what happened to the kids? And then basically she's like, we made him into our own image. And then she passes away with her last breath. I love that. It was it had a horror element to it that was really fun and interesting. And then when tension was at its height, you know, like a great horror movie, then you get Alex showing up. Yep. And uh, and there's a little comedic element. He's like, whoa, whoa, partner. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, you're about to shoot him. And then he's, at this point, he's a little funny because he's been in the Rossi by himself the whole time. Yep. And I find that that was one of the cooler scenes when Alex takes his wedding ring off and it floats up and he has all the, the moon gravity pulls and yeah. the, the mathematics around it. And so he starts slingshotting off the gravity pulls to get him to Ganymede without having to turn his in- engines on. Yeah. And uh, what gave you the idea for that? Were you just using that slingshot sport? Uh, that yeah, you know? yeah, that was the idea. So Narain really liked the idea of slingshotters, people doing this kind of style of racing where they're using gravity wells to, to speed up and all that. So he wanted to put that in. He, he thought that was a, a fun way to, you know, to have Alex get down to the, the planet without being spotted. And he has actually done interviews where he talks about how he fucked it up. It, one thing I love about Narain, Narain is a super smart guy. He's an incredibly competent guy. Mm-hmm. And he does not have that ego where if he makes a mistake, he can't ever admit he made a mistake. He does not have that, which right. I really respect in people. So when he was putting the scene together, like somebody was like, you know, it would take weeks to do that or, or longer to, to do all that. And you're showing it like it's happening in like a few minutes. And he's like, yeah, that's my fault. I screwed that up. Like, yeah. like he, he, was, he just was so excited by the visual of it. Yeah. That he wasn't thinking about the reality of it. And yeah. he usually doesn't do that. He's usually, usually always thinking about the reality as well. Yeah. That one, he just got too excited about the way the visual would play, kind of forgot about the reality of it. And so it, it, it doesn't make any sense the way it's actually visually depicted. It, it wouldn't work that way. Yeah. But it's, it's a beautiful scene. And I understand what he was excited about. I understand why he was so excited to do those particular visuals because you get some great shots in there, some amazing visuals of, of the ship whipping around those moons and yeah, yeah it was really incredible. Cool. And if you think about it, there's probably three or four people in the world that knew that that wasn't accurate. You know? and <laughs> the rest of people were like, Oh, that's trust, fucking that awesome. Me, all four, all four of them emailed. So. <laughs> yeah. You probably know all four of them kind of through the, through the show. They all emailed me. So yeah. yeah. Bobby gives captain Martin a great a ass whooping. And it was so satisfying. And, yeah. uh, she starts to put the pieces together. She steals his iPad or future iPad. She figures out that Jules Pierre Mao was at a point where Earth, it wasn't really working out with them. So then he did a, a sales demo for Mars Yep. and it got a little bit out of hand. And then now Mars is covering up. Is Mars covering it up because they are interested in that weapon? And oh, so, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No, that that as the viewers discover later when we meet Korshinov, who's the the Martian. I think he's the Minister of Defense for 
for Mars. Mm -hmm. There's conversations between him and Aaron Wright where it becomes very clear mm -hmm. that both planets were bidding on this technology. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, Mao is using the competitiveness between these two planets to maximize his his payout from the project that he developed. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And I think Rob did a really great job with that sequence after she whooped his ass and then she whooped the guard's ass and she's walking out. And it has that Odessa steps type editing where the tension is really yeah. built in where every time she passes a guard, how he manages time as she's walking through each thing and she passes a guard and she looks and then she passes the guard and she's almost there at the end and they go, hey, you. And she takes off running and she runs to the yep. UN and gets political asylum. That was a great sequence. That it's, piece. I, I really like what the layout says, that there's this red line on the ground and then there's a few hundred steps of a concrete and then there's a blue line on the ground and that's like that no man's land and here's where earth starts and here's where mars starts you know like the embassy that's one of those sequences where our inability to do what was in the script led to i think a better thing mm -hmm. because in the script it was originally supposed to be scripted she breaks out of the embassy and she goes running and she runs through the city to get to wherever she's going to ask for asylum and we just couldn't do it. There, we just there was no way to shoot it. There was no way to get enough footage of her running to justify it. So we were talking about it in the writers room, and I said, "Why don't we just do that kind of like where it's like the the land that an embassy is on is considered to be the territory of the country whose embassy that is? Mm -hmm. Like, why don't we just do that? Like, there's a little plot of ground. It's that's Martian the embassy, so that's technically Mars territory. Mm -hmm. And then there's just a fence." Mm -hmm. And once you cross that fence, now you're out of the Martian territory and you're back on Earth. And that way we can just show her running across that one section of ground. And we don't have to like try to because th there were ways we could fake that she ran through the city, but they all would have they would not have looked good. Mm -hmm. it, would, it wouldn't have turned out well. Right. And I love the overhead that we wound up getting. Mm -hmm. There's this great overhead shot mm -hmm. where you can see the orange line on the ground and the blue line on the ground. And you see her running across between them. And I think it's actually better than what was scripted mm -hmm. because we didn't know we were going to have that limitation. Right. And sometimes you wind up lucky like that, where it's like, we can't do the thing we wrote. Yeah. Let's try and find something else out to do. And it winds up, I think in many cases, it winds up being a better thing. Right. So you're taking credit for it, your idea? I wonder if I know that. Uh, it, yeah, it, it was my idea. <laughs> it, um, it but, kinda, but give the give, give the credit to Rob because oh you don't have to do you don't have to do the ceremonial like I'm no, gonna no, ta no, I'm no, gonna take but credit but the real hero it, but yeah. <laughs> just let everybody know this was Ty Frank's idea the idea was thing, mine it was a great idea but it was the a great way sequence. that it was shot and the the success of it yeah. is because of Jeremy and and Rob the way they shot that to really show what it was because yeah. you could have taken that same idea and shot it wrong and it would have just been confusing and stupid. Right. So, you know, give uh, credit where it's due. But I, I do, I am fascinated that like with the whole North and South Korea and the border there. And when you right. movies or stories or anything that takes place on that border where you have this one dividing line, you step over here and you're in a completely different culture, a completely different time, a completely different economic system, a completely different structure of government. And you step on the other one, it's completely different. And so there is something fascinating with that. So great idea, Ty. Well, it, um, I, I stole it from The Simpsons, of course, <laughs> because, because there's an episode where they go to Australia and Homer... Like he keeps jumping back and forth. He jumps into the embassy and goes, no, I'm in America. And then he jumps across the line. No, I'm in Australia. And he keeps going back and forth. And eventually the Marine guard punches him in the face <laughs> and goes, we don't tolerate that kind of thing here in America, sir. <laughs> you know, you guys should do a special thank you to the Simpsons. Oh, yeah. On the expanse because of, oh, we first so of all, Simpsons the things. expanse culture the how simpsons is is intertwined in the expanse culture in our social like our hangout culture around yeah. the expanse but also within the show how many yep. how much of an influence the simpsons has been to the show i think narain could write several books about the simpsons and and, <laughs> and like he is a simpsons scholar and it's kind of yeah. like if you don't know The Simpsons, you will have a hard time at some point communicating with Narain because his references are like, you know, it's kind of like that Simpsons episode or, yeah. you know what, you need to watch this. And if you're going through something, you need to watch this Simpsons episode to really kind of get <laughs> Well, we've, we've had people in the writer's room, you know, because obviously we've had some writers come and go across the six seasons we were doing the show. We've had some people in the writer's room who were not 
Simpson scholars. Did they get fired? And they did struggle to keep up. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough. It's tough to keep I up. I wonder if somebody came in and was like, ah, yeah, I, I'm just not into the Simpsons. I wonder if they would have a job the next day. Um, well, they certainly don't have a job the next year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you better go start watching some Simpsons. You want to hang around here. Yeah. So we're on the Obergast and they're sending uh, drones down to kind of see what's going down there and they keep disappearing. One drone finally makes it down to the ground and you see this almost like a pyramid of proto molecule and then it shuts off. That was a really cool, mysterious, th- you see like a little glimpse and like, what the fuck was that? And they ended at that point. Um, one of the things I wasn't clear on is Dr. Aturbe arguing with him about taking the ship down there because he's saying the, dr- the probes aren't working. We're yeah. not getting any information. Yeah, and as you see later in the show, I mean, this is a couple episodes from now, but the ship does have the ability to go down to the cloud layer of Venus. Mm-hmm. Um, it's designed for that, and you actually see that that system deploying. Mm-hmm. And I think it's the last episode of this season. Yeah. And what he's saying is, let's let's go down there. Let's get as low as we can, as yeah. low as the ship will let us go. If you were in that position, if you were on that ship, and you had a chance to see what was going on down there, would you take that chance? To see what was going on? Or would you be like, no? It's creepy. What's happening is creepy. And you know that the protomolecules killed 100,000 or more people at this point. Yeah. And you don't know what its intentions are. Yeah. So I see why there would be a lot of hesitation. But at the same time, if you're a scientist, you are witnessing maybe the most important event in human history, which is our interaction with what he thinks is an alien species. Yeah. I think if you're a scientist, scientists will take great risks for great discoveries but i'm talking about ty frank i'm talking about you personally because i think about this all the time because i think about like like i think about close encounters like richard dreyfus and close encounters and i'm like if i was in that situation would i go to see would you get on the mothership would i get on the mothership or if i was in the situation where we're over venus and there's something's going on down there because i'm extremely curious yeah. And too. so like, would my curiosity outweigh my fear or would my fear outweigh my curiosity? Because let's say that you had a chance to go into yeah. mothership, close encounters and see what this is like and see another civilization, another culture. And you didn't do it. Like, you know, and then you're like, well, fuck it. I'm dying anyway. You know, at some point, like I could have went and seen this other, yeah. it had this other experience. Whatever. I, I, so I think it's fascinating to think about. And I think at the end of the day, the deciding factor was be like, look, I'm, I'm going to die anyway. So why not take this one chance to see something that no human being, at least that I'm aware of, has ever seen in another it's, world, another civilization? And it could be like oh, Cocoon, you know, where you, you yeah. go up there and you get like all that energy. And I'm sorry, go ahead. I no, I, I find it very interesting that that is that is a human that's so human. The opportunity to see something that no other human has seen before really does drive us. I, I think that's a, a maybe even a uniquely human thing. Like, I don't know any other species, and obviously we can't talk to other species, so we're not sure what their motivations are, but like humans will literally risk their lives for no gain other than I saw a place no one has seen before. Mm. And I don't know why, why we have that drive, but we do. And I, I totally get it. Like, you know, I, I was talking about, you know, we went out and visited uh, Blue Origin, mm-hmm. Jeff Bezos' rocket company. Right. We went out and visited and we were joking with those guys who are like, hey, when you finally send people up, you know, we should get a free ride. I think you and I were like bugging them like, hey, you should give us a free ride on the rocket. Like talking to Daniel, Daniel would never do that because he's like, if there's even any chance that that thing is going to blow up on the launch pad or whatever, like, why would I take that risk? But for me to do a thing that so few people have done to see the earth from orbit, to look down at the planet from that high up, to, to look into space with no atmosphere in between. Yeah, I'd, I'd totally do it. Yeah. Like, if it was 50-50, probably not. Yeah. But if they're like, you know, there's a 5% chance this will blow up, I'd be like, yeah, 1 in 20, I'm going to do it. Yeah. I'd give it a try. Yeah. There's something that's just so fascinating to me that if I had an opportunity to be able to really experience or really see something, which we, you have no idea what's, what's going to happen and what it's going to do, my curiosity would be so powerful that I would do it because, you know, you do it and then they, they probe you and then they kill you. Um, and that's, that's the, you know, and that's the, the downside, but what would be more painful? Like being, you know, a 90 year old person in your bed and being like, God damn, I could have went and seen this thing. Right. You know, you know, and, what's and, funny and, is that mothership that Dreyfus and all those other guys got on that ship had only stopped because they needed like snacks. They needed supplies for the flight home. They picked up some humans to take with them for food. <laughs> I was trying to figure that out. I was, I was like, wait a minute, what? Yeah, <laughs> that's hilarious. They're like, 
man, we're fucking hungry. Have you ever tried humans? <laughs> Yeah, like, let's let's yeah, stop by and, Earth. And they're like, look, we yeah, last time we stopped by there, like, you know, it was when they were creating the pyramids and, and uh we helped them with the pyramids whatever and they gave us a few of the humans and they were delicious. So they were yeah, delicious, like, yeah. We, you go down there, you do a little lights, you know, they think they're you know, little musical things and uh and then inevitably they just kinda wander on the ship. <laughs> and then they send like their most innocent children aliens out there to like walk them up because they don't think they're bad and then when they close the doors like ah! you know, and they're coming. Um uh yeah. So we're on Earth, and Aaron Wright is coming up with levers that they can have over Jules Pierre Mao, and he mentions Peaches for the first time. The first time we hear Clarissa Mao's name in there, and he talks about her and how that they could use her to get to the father. And uh, Avasarala lets him know that there's going to be a council and an investigation of what happened on Eros, and he's going to be the center of it. And you can see on his face calculating Okay, so now I'm in yep. the center of this, and you see his survival mode kick in. So that whole yep. morality that you got a window in in the last episode, that window closes, and he's in the survival mode now. And yep. Avisarala does not know she's in danger. I don't think she's blind to it, but I don't think she recognizes how far he'll go to protect yeah. himself. Well, yeah. I mean, she clearly suspects the invitation to go on Jules Pierre's mount yep. yacht. She clearly suspects that that could be a trap. Yep. But do you think that she has suspicion against Aaron Wright at that point? I don't think she sees what Aaron Wright's game is. I think she's suspicious of them both. What she wasn't is suspicious of the two of them together. Mm -hmm. And that's because at that point, it's it's very clear to her. And in reality, this is this is true that they're not working together anymore. Mm -hmm. So she she thinks this is a separate thing now. Yeah. And like later in the in the next couple episodes, we'll see that. No spoilers. The level of manipulation Aaron Wright has been doing. Mm -hmm. So this episode had a lot of punchable faces in it. You got Dr. Strickland, you got <laughs> Aaron Wright and Jules Pierre Mao, who are basically manipulating this thing, killing a bunch of people. And then you have uh, uh, Bobby's. Uh, oh, yeah. Captain, Captain, Captain Martins, Captain Martins, who's probably the winner of the punchable faces. What would you say? Well, he's certainly the one who gets punched. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, I guess no. Doctor Strickland experiment with kids that that that's probably the most punchable face. Well, I but see Strickland Strickland goes to that next level because there's punchable faces and then there's this guy needs to be shot in the face with a shotgun mm -hmm. and we know where we know where, where on that scale Strickland is right. <laughs> and what Ty is doing is he's pointing out how we're narrowing down our next list, which is going to be the most punchable faces in in uh, fictional characters. And because we happen to have the list police as our producer, and that's Clint Trucks, and he gets very particular about his list. So the way that Clint uh, described it is is that, and that, and I agree with this, is that we're going to think of our top five most punchable characters, fictional characters, but it's punchable. So it's somebody that you would punch in the face and people would cheer. But if you kick their teeth out, they would think you went too far and they would they would they would have an issue with it. So if you think about Ray Fines and Schindler's List. Of course, it's punchable, but he needs to be killed, you know. And yeah. so, if you if you kicked his teeth out, nobody's going to care because he he's went too far. So these are fictional characters, and a good example that Ty gave to kind of give you the tone of what we're talking about is the principal in Ferris Bueller's Day Off, and he 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 was very punchable, but not teeth kick outable. And <laughs> teeth kick outable is the next level, and then after teeth kick outable, it's murder. Right. And so this is, we're keeping it in the... In well, the, there's, there's punch, there's serious physical injury that causes permanent harm, and right. there's death. And there's death. This is, yeah. this is the punch. This is not like, I'm going to break your arm and leave you damaged for life. Yeah, like if you punch them, you'd feel great about it. If you kick their teeth out, you would probably have a hard time yeah. later uh, sleeping at night. So to start off the list, first, as always, Die Hard tops the list with Harry Ellis and Die Hard. And, uh, Ellis... Die Hard. Ellis is the most punchable character in all of cinema. Most punchable, but he's so much punchable that he's almost not punchable because he's such a good time when you watch him. No, he's he's great in that part, but when he's hitting on McLean's wife, if Bruce had popped him in the in the nose, we would have all cheered. That's true. That's true. Bob now, now we didn't cheer. We didn't cheer though when Hans shoots him. Yeah, that, that's too far. It, he didn't deserve it. It was too far, and that. That is a great example of what this list is specifically because if McLean showed up and punched him in the face, you would feel good about it. But when Han shot him, you felt a little bad about it. Yeah. Bob Sugar from Jerry Maguire. 
bully in a Christmas story who ends up getting punched in the face, and it was a great scene. Yeah, yeah. Percy from the Green Mile. The guy the, in the Matrix, Joey Pants. Joey Pantaloni. What's his name? Cypher? Uh, Cypher. Cypher. Is it Uppin from Save It Private Ryan? Oppum. Oppum. Yeah. Definitely wanted to punch that guy. James Spader in basically any 80s movie <laughs> that he was in. <laughs> James Spader in the 80s, man. That was the most punchable guy in cinema. <laughs> that was the most. I'm going to mispronounce. Is it Nurse Hatchet? No, Ratchet. Nurse Ratchet. Ratchet. Nurse Ratchet in uh, Cuckoo's Nest. Uh, Joe Pesci in Lethal Weapon 2. Joffrey in Game of Thrones. John Turturro in Miller's Crossing. Am I forgetting any? I mean, I'm forgetting yeah, a lot. I would, I, would, I would say also John Turturro in Do the Right Thing. John Turturro in Do the Right Thing. He's, he's just, he's got a lot of punchable. I know, I know I'm missing a lot. Oh, you're missing tons. There's tons. Yeah. yeah. Well, There's millions of face. these. Yeah. People are screaming yeah. right now. People are screaming and listening like, you forgot about. Uh, well, the four that are left from last time. The uh, four, the four the we four. still have left. They're all yelling right now. Uh, yeah. The four. The, now it's down to three. Um, uh, Clint, <laughs> am I missing any? Do you have any that, uh, that you're thinking of? Uh, I don't know if this is the audience for this, but Dolores Umbridge from the Harry Potter movies, she's the goddamn worst. <laughs> <laughs> you know this character at all? <laughs> okay, we'll put Dolores in there. Uh, yeah, she's in there. Who else? Well, who's who's the kid though? The the bad kid in Harry Potter is uh, Draco or Draco Malfoy? Yeah, Draco Malfoy. I I think that actor played him as very punchable in the movie. Yeah, but I I feel like Draco does get punched. <laughs> <laughs> Does that well, some of these people do get punched. I mean, uh, uh, hey. Joe Pesci in Lethal Weapon Two oh, does get punched. He gets in the punched face. a lot. And then Draco, the, very the, the principal in uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off has a very bad day. Um, he has a bad day. But I, I uh, doesn't. But, uh, no, he doesn't get punched in the face. He gets kicked in the face by his sister. Right? Yeah, three times. His, you know, and, and he gets what he steps in mud. He gets yeah. like uh, he, he gets all kinds of stuff. What I like about this list is because. You know, there's, it's also a personal thing, like, to, cause there might be somebody that just for a personal re, like, you know, there, there's probably characters that you hate more than probably other people hate them just because there's something personal about them that rubs you the wrong yeah. way. Like Percy in the Green Mile, like, I, I don't think I've ever hated another character as much as I hated that guy. So he's definitely, oh, what about the cool guy in, uh, Teen Wolf? Oh, yeah. I, I don't remember that movie as well as you do. Yeah. I, I mean, I saw it when it That's came Styles? out. Yeah, style. No, no, no. Styles was his buddy. He was a good guy. He was cool. Styles was the coolest. You know, I know people are going to say William Zapta from Karate Kid, but I, I liked, I like him. <laughs> I like William Zapta. <laughs> he was, and, you know, we've we've talked about that. That you know, if you really think about it, he was kind of right. Daniel was kind of kind of a douche. Well, he was <laughs> certainly right when he's trying to roll a joint to while taking shit, and then they, uh, Ralph Macchio sprays him down with a hose, and then they go and yeah. kick his ass. What the fuck did Ralph Macchio expect? You know. <laughs> You spray somebody with a hose, there's going to be repercussions. I don't want to say Billy Bob from Tombstone because I, I think he's fucking awesome. I love him in that. Uh, but but he did need to get punched, and then he got punched. <laughs> yeah, so it's did. it's okay. Like when he's, are you gonna when he's like yelling at the, the guys who are playing cards and just being an asshole, yeah. he needed to get smacked. It's like playing with my sister's kids or something. <laughs> uh, yeah. what, what about Bill Paxton in uh, True Lies? Yeah, except that. So here's the thing. Uh, and, may, and maybe this is where I differ on this list is he just always seemed like he was having a great now. Okay. Yes. He's a sexual predator. Don't be a sexual predator. I'm not justifying the way he treats women. What I am saying though, is in all his interactions with everybody, he always just seemed like he was having a great time. And, and Bill like, Paxson is so damn likable. He's so likable. Even he as never he seemed like he was doing anything yeah. to make other people yeah. feel bad. Like he's saying all kinds of horrible shit to Arnold. Yeah, but he's not saying it to make Arnold feel bad. He's just saying it because he's having a great time and he thinks it's fun to talk about that shit. Right? Yeah. That a, feels less punchable to me. That would be a fun list, like the worst character that you still like, <laughs> you know, because the character is like so likable. And there's something about Bill Paxton, and, he, and he's got a tiny dick. It's pathetic. <laughs> I mean, you got you got to feel bad for him, right? <laughs> it's pathetic. What? Uh, who else? Who was the other guy? That, what was that movie where the guys always I figured his- out who needs to get punched in Karate Kid? It's the Cobra Kai Sensei. Oh um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so he can be the guy. So he can be the guy from Karate Kid. Okay. Do you think Joffrey tops the list? Well, okay. So th- that that's interesting that yes, because I was actually going to bring that up. Like first season, Joffrey super punchable, and when Tyrion starts smacking him around, it's incredibly satisfying. 
But when he's like murdering hookers in his bedroom, he he elevates out of punchable into this guy needs to get murdered, right? Okay, yeah. So, so like I think first season Joffrey incredibly punchable. Okay, first season Joffrey's top of the list. Okay. Yeah, but by like third or fourth season, like I'm just waiting for somebody to kill him. What about Snake and Stand by Me? He's punchable when he puts the cigarette punchable. out in his face. Yeah. Okay, so Percy's definitely on my list. So we'll put first season Joffrey number one, Percy number two. Oh, I'm sorry, Harry, Henry Ellis is yeah, number Ellis one. Yeah, Ellis has got to be number one. Ellis is number one. Yeah. Season one Joffrey, Percy from the Green Mile. So I have to ask the question, would Carter Burke be on this list? He seems like he needed to be punched in the face. Now, eventually he needs to get killed. Like he develops up to the point. But when he's like, after all the Marines have been killed and he's in the APC and he's going... You know, there's a substantial dollar value attached to this station. You know, he doesn't have the authority to make that kind of decision. He's just a grunt. In that moment, somebody needs to punch him in the face. Yeah, but he he's killable, I think. Well, later he is. At least. Like, by the end of the movie, he's killable. Mm -hmm. But at that point, I don't think he's killable. At that point, he just needs to get punched. When he, For yeah, the when audience, he, Ty, who is Carter Burke? He's the Paul Reiser character in Aliens. And anybody who doesn't know that isn't listening to our dumbass podcast. <laughs> that, that is a great point. Down to two listeners. <laughs> <laughs> nah, he's killable, man. I think uh, because when the reveal comes out, he's already passed the killable threshold. Yeah. Nurse Ratchet, I think, because I don't think. She's the worst. She's the worst. She's the worst. She's the worst. Yeah. So she could be number four, and now we need number five. You know, James Spader is interesting. I think a fun spinoff list will be what actor played the most punchable characters. <laughs> well, and Spader would definitely be on that Spader, list. And I think the James Spader character from Pretty in Pink and the Craig Schiffer character from Some Kind of Wonderful would be a tie for fifth for me. Um, incredibly punchable. But what about Spader in Lesson Zero? I mean, he's terrible in that. Yeah, I, I think that, but I think he's worse than just punchable in that. Like, he's legitimately. You like think a, he elevates the teeth kick in? Yeah, yeah. Okay. If, if if somebody curb stomped him a little bit, yeah. I don't think anybody would have been upset. Yeah, you're right. Cause Pretty in Pink, like the way that he um, lied, you know, and, yep. and, and played both sides on uh, to Molly Ringwall where he's trying to, yep. where she rejected him, but then he told lies. Of it. Yeah, yeah. So I, I agree with that. I think Pretty in Pink, uh, Spader wins. But, Greg Schaefer. Yeah, so that we'll, we'll have a tie. Greg Schaefer. Yeah, because the, the moment when um, Elias Kateas and all his gang of punks break into the party at the end to save Eric Stoltz from getting his ass kicked, and it becomes very clear that Elias Kateas is about to beat the shit out of Craig Schaefer, and we don't actually see it happen, but when it becomes clear that's what's about to happen, it is so satisfying. That's like the best moment in that movie. You know what's great about having three listeners is that let's have the, the listeners win this tie because it's easy for them to win the tie because it's only three of them. So Craig Schaefer and some kind of wonderful or James Spader and pretty in pink. Yeah. And, and we'll have a runoff and winner gets a signed copy of one of Ty's books. <laughs> you, you keep promising that to people <laughs> they, and the people aren't getting that. So you're, you're, I mean, what was the other, when did I promise your books last time? You were, you were promising to give books to people who, um, what was it? It was, oh, people who wrote a story about what happened to Amos. Oh, which is, this, shows up with the which coat. is the, oh, and Clint, you, you, did you find a winner for that, Clint? Jesus Christ, Clint. That was, we're not doing that way. We have to do it. I said that we were going to do it and it came out, right? So we got it. We got to follow through and then I just won't say it again, but we have to follow through <laughs> for that one. Hey, maybe you should be promising things like uh, if you win the contest, Amos will record your voicemail message. No, here's this will be funny. OK, so I'll do a contest and promise something that you have to do within reason. And then the next one, when we will have a contest at anything. Next one, you'll promise something that I have to do for right. the winner within reason. Uh, that won't get us uh, fired or ostracized. We can make. Didn't you already give a bunch of my books away? So I think you've already used yours. So I, I you're right. You're correct. I did <laughs> use mine. So whoever wins that fiction, me and Ty are not going to read, but uh, the producer might read. Will wins uh, signed autograph and a pair of Ty's underwear, and um, and then and then you can choose <laughs> what I have to do for the next episode. We'll right. do it. We'll do, we didn't do a contest then, so we'll think of a contest and then you choose what I want to have. But you have, okay. to, you have to run it by me first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we got our list. And uh, please help us out with the tiebreaker with uh, James Spader or Craig Schaefer. 
Thank you for hanging out with us. This was a great episode. There, here be dragons, and uh, I had a great time. And I always here, have, there be dragons. Whatever. And uh, <laughs> we love you guys. Come hang out with us again next episode. We're going to be talking about The Expanse Season 2, Episode 12. We're getting close to finishing Season 2. And, uh, and we'll talk soon. Say goodbye, Ty. Goodbye, Ty.